introduce our session five that will cover in vitro binding study for locally acting GI drug products. Our first presentation in session five is on the in vitro binding studies for bioclovance demonstration. This will be presented by session lead, Dr. Wei J. Sun, who joined FDA in 2018 and is currently in the Office of Research and Standards in OGD. He's been working and collaborating on several projects to improve generic quality and provide new standards for FDA. Our second presentation is on assessing API sameness. Our presenter, Dr. Hang Mei Li, is currently a Senior Pharmaceutical Quality Assessor in Cedar OPQ Office of Lifecycle Drug Products. She serves as Application Technical Lead, leads interdisciplinary assessment teams, and performs quality assessment on liquid-based drug product ANDA applications, including many first generic or complex drug products. She joined FDA in 2015. Our third presentation is on the in vitro assessments that support in vitro binding studies and demonstrating bioequivalence of locally acting gastrointestinal drugs. Our presenter, Dr. Manar Algabish, joined Hi. FDA in 2015. In 2021, Manar moved to ORS and OGD, where she continues to be involved in regulatory science related to therapeutic performance of oral dosage forms. Our final presentation in session five is on common deficiencies and case studies of in vitro binding equivalent studies. Our presenter, Dr. Hong Fei Zijo, is a senior pharmacologist in the Division of Bioequivalence 3, Office of Bioequivalence in OGD. He joined OGD in 2014 as a bioequivalence assessor and has been actively involved in multiple scientific regulatory working groups either as a group lead or a team member. Please join me in welcoming our first pre presenter, Dr. Wei J. Sun. Thank you for the introduction. This section is in vitro binding study for locally acting GI drug products. My presentation title is in vitro binding studies for bioequivalence demonstration. For this presentation, I will give an overview of in vitro binding studies and how to conduct and evaluate in vitro binding studies. The learning objective is that the first one is to understand the rationales for performing in vitro binding studies for locally acting dry drug products for bioequivalence demonstration. The second one is to be familiar with the study designs of in vitro binding studies including the kinetic studies and the equilibrium study. The third objective is to know how to evaluate affinity constant and the capacity constant. The bioequivalence evaluation is based on 90% confidence intervals of the capacity constant, which is K2. B is essential for development and approval of generic drugs. BE is defined as, allow me to restore it, the extent of a significant difference in the rate and extent to which the active ingredient or active moiety in pharmaceutical equivalence or pharmaceutical alternative becomes available at the site of drug action when administered at the same molar dose under similar conditions in an appropriate designed study. So briefly, if two products are bioequivalent, they are equal in the rate and extent to drug substance becomes available at the site of drug actions. The BE determination approach could be varied based on the load of administration and whether these products are for systemic function or for locally acting function. BE can be established using in vivo method or in vitro methods. Pharmacokinetic studies are the most commonly used approach to determine the BE. It measures the rate and extent of drug absorbed into systemic circulation. The rate and the extent of drug absorption is determined by CMAX and AUC respectively. When a PK study cannot be used to determine BE, 
a pharmacodynamic study can be selected as an alternative method. Establishment of a dose-response relationship is key to use this approach for B determination. For clinical trial, it may need to show that the test product is equivalent to the reference product and uh, effective as compared to the placebo. Sometimes in vitro studies have more advantage than human PK studies in demonstrating BE. It is commonly used for complex drug products, including the locally acting dry drugs. Applicants can also propose their own BE demonstration approach and then discuss with the agency. For the locally acting GI drugs, drug substances are not intended to be absorbed into the systemic circulation. The drug concentration at the site of action may not be the same as the drug systemic plasma concentration. The local drug concentrations cannot be measured directly. In addition, bioavailability of the drug product may be low and the drug plasma concentration could be limited. As a result, instead of the PK study, in vitro studies can be used for BE demonstration. For locally acting GI drug products, some drug substances bind to phosphate, potassium, or bioasset to have therapeutic efficacy. For these drug products, the drug substances bind to adsorbate to form insoluble complexes through ionic and hydrogen bonding and then are eliminated in the feces. So the bioavailability of these drug products are very low, and the PK studies is not feasible to determine the BE for generic drug products. So instead of urine PK study, the in vitro binding studies, which can reflect mechanism of action, are more appropriate. FDA published product specific guidance, PLG, to describe FDA's current thinking and expectation on how to develop generic drug products, therapeutically equivalent to corresponding reference drug products. PSG recommends in vivo or in vitro study to establish B between generic drug and the reference drug products. Currently, there are 17 PSG recommends in vitro by these studies. Based on the mechanism of action, these drug products can be classified into four areas bind phosphate in GI tract, bind bioasset in GI tract, bind potassium in GI tract, and bind pexin and bioasset in GI tract. For phosphate binding, these drug products are for the treatment of renal disease. It reduces serous phosphate in patients by binding dietary phosphate to drug substance. For bioasset binding, these products reduce serum cholesterol. For potassium binding, it is for the treatment of hyperkalemia in patients by binding dietary potassium to drug substance. For protein and bioasset binding, which is sucrophate, it is for the treatment of active duodenal ulcer. There are some drug substances listed under each classification. For some of the drug substances, they may have more than one dosage form. For example, sucrophate has two dosage forms, tablet and the suspensions. In general, the in vitro binding study contains connected binding studies and the equilibrium binding studies. To demonstrate B between the generic products and the reference products, in addition to in vitro kinetic and the equilibrium binding study, other studies may be recommended for the locally acting dry drugs in the product specific guidance based on the property of the drug substance or properties of the drug products. For example, API Semini studies are recommended for several drug products to demonstrate BE. Formulation, characterization, and the in vitro pathogen activity study are recommended for sucrophate tablet and suspension. The competitive dissolution study is recommended for lethal carbonate chewable tablet. This talk focuses on in vitro kinetic binding study 
and the in vitro equilibrium body study. Other studies will be covered by other presentations. The first one is in vitro kinetic binding study. The in vitro kinetic binding study can assess the rate and the binding and demonstrate how much time it takes to reach the maximum binding when a sorbet concentration is fixed in the binding solution. The sorbet here means phosphate or bioacid. It can identify that how much incubation duration is needed for equilibrium binding study, which support the equilibrium study. To conduct the in vitro kinetic binding study, usually two or three adsorbent concentrations are prepared. The lowest and the highest concentration usually corresponds to concentrations used in the equilibrium binding study. If three adsorbent concentrations are prepared, the middle concentration is about 50% of the highest concentration. Then at least at different length of time should be used to incubate test product and the reference product with two or three different adsorbent concentration. The selected time should show that the maximum binding is reached. For the test product and the reference product comparison, it should calculate TR ratio at different time points. The left table evaluates TR ratio at each time point. The value of TR ratio should be compared, but not for 90% confidence interval evaluation. The right figure is an example of connecting binding profile to compare test product and the reference product. X axis is time, and the Y axis is the percentage of adsorbent binding. From the figure, it shows that the percentage of adsorbent binding increase when the binding time increase, and then it reaches to plateau, which is the maximum binding. For the in vitro equilibrium binding study, it is considered as the pivotal study and is used for biowaver decision for additional strengths. The equilibrium binding study is performed for both test product and the reference product. It can be used to calculate the binding affinity constant and the capacity constant. Affinity constant is related to the magnitude of the force involved in the binding process. Capacity constant is the maximum amount of adsorbate, which can be bound per unit weight of the drug substance. To conduct the in vitro equilibrium binding study, it is performed under the conditions of the specified time, which is usually equilibrium binding time, and the varying absorbent concentrations. This slide discuss how to conduct in vitro equilibrium binding study. This study is performed by equating the test product and the reference product with at least at different adsorbate concentrations. It is important to select suitable adsorbate concentrations to obtain the accurate capacity constant, K2, which is used to determine 90% confidence interval. The figure here is an example of equilibrium binding profile. X axis is the initial concentration of adsorbate, and the Y axis is the bound adsorbate. It is not able to measure the bound adsorbate concentrations in the media directly, so we can measure the unbound adsorbate and then calculate the bound adsorbate. The selected concentration should contain the increasing portion of the binding curve until the maximum binding is reached. In addition, to ensure the maximum binding, it should include at least two concentrations at plateau. Then we can use the Lemieux equation to calculate affinity constant and the capacity constant, KQ. BE determination is based on the 90% confidence interval of capacity constant with acceptance criteria of 80% to 120%. To prepare median for adsorbate, the consideration for median pH preparation should be physiologically relevant. 
The median pH should also be sensitive enough to detect mighty differences between the test product and the reference product. Other factors may be considered for method development as needed. This table shows median pH recommendation in the product specific guidance. For example, for ferry citrate tablet and the ferry OC hydroxide trouble tablet, the product specific guidance recommend pH 1.2, 3.0, and 7.5 for adsorbent medium. This is because the binding ability of the substance to phosphate is affected by medium pH. The drug substance has higher binding ability at the low pH and the lower binding ability at the high pH. It considers the solubility and the pKa of drug substance. In addition, this pH media cover the human GI tract pH range. As a result, these three pH are recommended for adsorbate media preparation. Take another example of methyl carbonate. pH 1.2, pH 3, and pH 5 are recommended for the in vitro equilibrium binding study. This takes drug solubility into the considerations. Under the higher pH, such as pH 7, the drug solubility is extremely low. Only small, only small amount of a drug can be dissolved in medium, so it is less sensitive. It also considers that the most of the dietary phosphate is bound at the upper GI tract, so pH 1.2, pH 3, and pH 5 are recommended. The Mill equation is commonly applied to describe absorption in solid liquid interface. For in vitro equilibrium binding study, the Mill equation describes the equilibrium between adsorbate and the adsorbent, which is just substance. This equation is used to evaluate affinity constant and the capacity constant. This is the Mill equation. X is the amount of adsorbate bound to the drug substance. M is the amount of drug substance used. C equilibrium is the adsorbate concentration remaining in the solution at equilibrium status. K1 and K2 are affinity constants and the capacity constants. We can rearrange the equation to obtain this new equation. Then we can plus C equilibrium divided by X over M versus C equilibrium and do the regression to generate a straight line. Affinity constant is slope divided by intercept. Capacity constant is 1 over slope. This slide shows step by step for in vitro equilibrium binding study and the calculation for K1 and K2. Initially, we prepare at least at concentrations of adsorbate. Because it is not able to measure the bound adsorbate, we can measure unbound adsorbate concentrations. Then the bound adsorbate concentration can be obtained by initial prepare concentrations minus unbound concentrations. Here, 1.7 is from 2 minus 0.3, 4.15 is from 5 minus 0.85, etc. Then transfer the unit from minimal to minimal to obtain x. M is used amount of drug substance, so the amount is known. The value of C equilibrium divided by x over M is from the calculation. Finally, we can plus C equilibrium divided by X over M versus C equilibrium and regress it to have the slope and intercept. Affinity constant and the capacity constant can be obtained from the calculation. This should be performed for both test product and the reference product to obtain their K2 and the determine 90% confidence intervals. This is the challenging question. The first question is that, which of the following is not the adsorbate for in vitro binding study? A. Phosphate B. Potassium C. Calcium 
D bioasset? The correct answer is C. Calcium is not the absorbent for in vitro binding study. Phosphate, potassium, and bioasset are subject for in vitro binding study. Question 2. The B assessment is based on 90% confidence interval of which of the following items? A. Affinity constant. B. Capacity constant. C. Test reference bound absorbent ratio. D. All of the above. I hope you all pick up option B, which is the correct answer. To summarize, some of the locally acting GI drug products present challenges for PK studies to determine BE. For this case, in vitro binding studies can reflect the drug mechanism of action and can be used to demonstrate bioequivalence. In general, the in vitro binding study contains kinetic study and the equilibrium study. In addition to in vitro binding studies, other studies may be recommended to establish BE, such as APSMNIS testing and the dissolution study. Third, to develop the method of in vitro binding kinetic study or equilibrium study, some factors should be considered for the study design. For example, incubation time and the absorbent concentration. Finally, the applicant may send control correspondence to the FDA to clarify BE recommendations in the product specific guidance. Or if the applicant have alternative proposal for BE demonstration, the applicant can also seek correspondence. Finally, I would like to thank Merna, Heather, MJ, Lei, and Rob for their input and the suggestion for the slide and the presentation. That's all my presentation. Thank you. Thanks so much for the introduction. Good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure here today to share with you about regulatory consideration for APSMNIS. The title for the talk today is Assessing APSMNIS. Here is the learning objectives. First, be able to identify the need for demonstrating APSMNIS recommended in products with guidance for complex products with complex APIs. Second, I wish after this explanation, you can have a better understanding the regulatory consideration and the principle for assessing APSMNIS. Let's start with the generic drugs. By regulatory, generic drugs need to be therapeutic equivalents to the reference list drug for approval. To demonstrate therapeutic equivalence, the generic drug needs to demonstrate pharmaceutical equivalence, bioequivalence, and the generic drug need to have the same clinical effect and safety profile to the RD. The definition for bioequivalence is a talk about in previous talk. So what's the definition for pharmaceutical equivalence? Pharmaceutical equivalence means the generic drug have the same active ingredients, same dosage form, strength, and same lot of administration, and the same condition of use. So generally, APSMNIS is required for generic drugs. Our section focuses on local acting GI drug product. Local acting GI drug product are considered as a complex drug product due to the complex lot of delivery, which is a local acting mechanism. Some of the GI product also contains complex API drug substances, such as synthetic polymer, heterogeneous uh, mixture of small molecules, or micromolecule complex are used as a drug substance in these drugs. To foster complex generic drug development and under submission and approval, FDA put a great efforts, published new or revised plastic guidance. These plastic guidance describe the agent's current thinking and expectation 
on how to develop generic drug product, the pure equivalent to the specific RD product. There are some examples of the policy guidance. So this uh, policy guidance is for selected local acting GI drugs, such as Farrick CHP tablet, Sivalimer carbonate for oral suspension, Sivalimer hydrochloride tablet, etc. There are several select examples for local acting GI drugs for this section. The PSG for this um, drug product recommended a bioequivalent in vitro or in vivo or other recommendations. Besides bioequivalent recommendations, the PSG also recommended for demonstration API semis in the for this product. Because all this second like example GI product, um, they're using complex API, such as ferric citrate, which is a ferric iron based com uh, conjugate complex or silver more carbonate, silver more hydrochloride, or uh, cholecephalum hydrochloride are uh, synthetic uh, polymers that use as a drug substance. Sodium zinconium cyclosilicate and uh, supercate are inorganic complex uh, used as a drug substance. In the PSG, the the PSG included the recommendation uh, Test and the characterization for demonstration API semis, which reflect the FDA's thinking and expectation on how to do the API semis. So next, I'd like to elaborate the general regulatory consideration in demonstration complex API semis. We recommend using orthogonal characterizations to provide analysis on the composition, structure, signature analysis, physical, um, chemical property, impurity profile, et cetera, for the complex APIs. Also, in the manufacturing process, evaluate standard material, critical intermediate step, critical quality attributes, and um, critical process parameters, and then the impact on the uh, complex APIs, physical chemical properties. We also recommend to provide biological properties through a comparative biological activity analysis if needed. So all these steps together we call the totality of the FDA approach. So this is the approach and steps FDA used when we develop uh, policy guidance and uh, review and uh, product uh, for, with the complex APIs. Here is a first challenging question. Which of the following statement is not true? A, FDA approved generic drugs are therapeutic equivalent to RD drugs. B, SH develops and issues new and revised policy guidance to foster generic drug product development, submission, and approval. C, demonstration, demonstrating API semis is often recommended in PSG for complex products with complex APIs. D, totality of evidence approach is used in developing PSG and reviewing under with complex APIs. Choose the answer which you think the same is not true. The correct answer is B, not SH, but it is FDA develop uh, and issue policy guidance to foster genetic drug development. Above, we talk about the totality of evidence approach is the general principle and the consideration for FDA to develop PSG and review generic products. Next. I'd like to use a supercate as an example to elaborate the consideration for demonstrating and uh, demonstrating and assessing API semis. Supercate suspension. The RD product is a surface suspension, uh, which is approved in 1993. 
The part of this indicated in short-term treatment of active duodenal ulcer, the drug mechanism of action is local actin, which uh, supercate is a one of the examples listed in the local actin gel drug above. The drug product contains drug substance, sucrophate. Uh, sucrophate has a USP monograph. So here is the structure and a empirical formula listed in the labeling and in the US monograph. On the right, it maybe have a better view for the structure of the sucrophate. It is a luminous salt of the uh, sucro-octosulfate, also have a free aluminum base. So it's a mixture of inorganic salt. It's insoluble in water, has some and soluble in diluted HCl, and it's a amorphous solid. There is a product guidance on supercase suspension, first recommended in July 2014, then revised in October 2017. Before the revision in, in 2017, the product guidance for supercase suspension recommended in vivo B study with clinical endpoints. Due to the challenges, such as enrollment of patients into the studies, the PSG was revised on October 2017 for in vitro B funding study options. In the revised PSG, there, there's a, a list of criteria to qualify for in vitro options. First, the test and the RD formulation have the same API. Second, the test and RD formulation are quantitatively and quantitatively the same, except the flavor and the color sapiens used. And a sample comparative physical chemical characterization of the test and the RD formulation, accessible bioassays of the test and RD formulation. So this is the requirement for the revised PSG on supercase suspension for in vitro option. You can see the demonstration of API semis is listed in the PSG. Also noted, the PSG for supercase tablet product also revised in 2019 and with a similar in vitro option requirement, which also required demonstration of API semis for the supercase. So the demonstration API semi is, uh, is recommended in PSG. The PSG also listed the calculation test for demonstration API semis. The recommended calculation include, but not limited to, first API composition, the supercate octosulfate and alumina content, and the element analysis data for carbon proton sulfur alumina of the test, test the API. And the data on the carbon sulfur and aluminum, uh, carbon aluminum ratio. Third, the acid neutralizing capacity of the test API and the spectroscopic characterizations such as FTIR, UV, solid star, aluminum NMR, DSC, TD, and polar SRV. So this is the recommended the test uh, characterization on the PSG for demonstration of APS semis. So how to conduct APS semis? Generally, there are four ways uh, or four approaches for conducting the studies. First, you can characterize the test API itself, which is recommended in this PSG. At least the three batch of test API should be characterized to assess APS semis. Or you can uh, compare analysis of test API with the extracted API from RD. This is a very common approach used uh, in the study. However, it's not very feasible for the supercate because there is a multiple insoluble component in the formulation and then there interferes in the characterization of the extracted APIs. Then you also may extract the API from test product compared with extract the API from RD product if both use the same uh, formulation. Or you can just analysis of the API in the drug, drug product formulation. You can per, uh, compare, 
comparative analysis of the test product and the RD product, which is also called Q3 um, categorization. So there's a four um, approaches to contact API semis. Uh, you can use in one or you can use in a combined uh, two or three or uh, method to conduct API semis. In this uh, PSG for SuperKit, the method one four are both listed in the PSG. Next, um, go to assessing API semis. How to assess API semis? First, the drug substance molecule formula need to consistent to the structural information in the labeling. So you can do the elemental analysis of the test API to, to the reasonable range of the proposing the uh, lab, uh, structure in the labeling or the USP monograph. Second, physical chemical properties of the API, such as API composition, as the neutralized capacity and impurity profile, etc., meet the USP test. So there is a USP monograph for the justins. Um, there are also the criteria to be met. Third, there is a various uh, spectroscopic analysis for the test API, which is uh, we recommend the orthogonal characterization approach. In addition to the PSG recommend test, we also encourage you to explore other calculation techniques to uh, to better uh, characterize the API. In addition, we also recommend have a, um, understanding the critical manufacturing process due to the complex API synthesis. For this case, the supercate, there is a critical step, luminization step from uh, sodium su uh, sucrose sulfate to the sulfate. And there is a luminal uh, region or species used, typically called a base polymer or luminal chloride used. However, the luminal species or region used is a complex in solution, depending on the basic value uh, hydroxy and uh, aluminum molar ratio. And the aluminum region and step can affect the physical property of the supercate complex, which in turn affect the proton subjectivity. And this is the report in the literature. So we recommend adequately categorize the aluminum region intermediate, identify critical process parameter and process control, and to have to study the evaluate the the critical manufacturing steps for the superface synthesis. So in the policy guidance, they also recommend comparative physical characterization of the test and MD formulation. There are seven comparative uh, characterization tests is uh, uh, recommended. Comparative pH, comparative specific gravity, comparative viscosity profile of untreated formulation, comparative change in apparent uh, viscosity with addition of acid, and a comparative uh, re re uh, diversibility, comparative acid neutralizing capacity, and uh, comparative aluminum release rate as pH 1.2. Uh, in all this, the highlight 4, 6, 7 are all related to the drug release uh, in local act, in local action. So in summary, the revised policy guidance for super case suspension recommended to demonstrate API symptoms, recommend Q1, Q2 formulation except for flavor and the color excipients, and then recommend comparative physical chemical characterization of test and RD product, and also come Parity bio IC of the test and LD product. The bio IC of test and LD product will be further uh, uh, discussed and elab uh, elaborated in the next talk by the FD colleagues. So all this together recommendation in PSG is reflect the totality of evidence approach to demonstrate the genetic drug will be therapeutic equivalent to the LD product. So here is come to the challenge question number two. Which of the following st studies is not recommended in the policy guidance for sucrophate oral suspension revised on October 2017? A, demonstrating APS symptoms. 
B, comparative phys uh, physicochemical characterization of test product and RD product. C, in vivo B study with a clinical endpoint. D, in vitro B bioassay binding studies. So, which the form study is not recommended in the policy guidance revised on 2017. So choose the answer you think is correct. The correct answer is C. In vivo B study with a clinical endpoint is not recommended in the revised PSC, but it's in the uh, policy guidance in 2014. The revised policy guidance is recommended in vitro B studies and with other APSME studies. In summary, we can say Demonstrating APSME is often recommended in product guidance for complex product with complex APIs. Also, uh, besides the, the, recomm the recommendation, uh, PSC recommendation test for APSME, other characterization techniques may be explored to ensure adequate characterization of the complex API. Uh, I also bring your message, whole message is the totality of evidence approach is generally used in demonstration and assessing APSMEs and the value study as well. Here is a closing thought for today's talk. We highly encouraging and adequate close communication with FDA with various channels such as control components, pre and meeting, etc. to promote the complex generic drug product development and approval. The last but not least acknowledgement, I'd like to many thanks to my OGD and OPQ colleagues for involving um, policy guidance revision and uh, generic product assessment teams. There are many people involved in this. Um, They're doing great work on this. And I want a special thanks to Dr. Dui Zhang and uh, Dr. Yan Wang from OSOGD, and a special thanks to Dr. Asif Rashid, Patricia Onimba, and Dr. Binka from LDPOPQ. Um, thank you all for your attention. Thank you for the introduction. For the third presentation of the session, I will focus on the in vitro assessment or physiochemical characterization that supports in vitro binding studies in demonstrating bioequivalence of locally acting gastrointestinal drugs. From this presentation, you will learn about the rationale behind in vitro assessment that support the binding studies for locally acting gastrointestinal or GI drugs. You will also learn to identify some examples of in vitro assessment recommended in product specific guidance, guidances or PSGs. And we will talk about sucrophate products as key cases. As mentioned earlier, locally acting GI drugs are not intended to be absorbed into the bloodstream. And their bioavailability is assessed by measurement that reflect the rate and extent to which the therapeutic ingredient is available at the site of action, which is the GI tract. Therefore, product specific factors and drugs mechanism of action are critical to identify those measurements that will be used in demonstrating bioequivalence or BE. This session we are focusing on the locally acting GI drugs where binding to specific agent is part of the mechanism. Examples are lanthanum carbonate, which is a phosphate binder and cosetramine, which is a bile acid binder. For this reason, 
In vitro binding studies are a practical PE approach to assess the performance of drug product at the site of action. As explained earlier in details, binding study involves equilibria and kinetic studies. Due to the complexity of those binders, other assessments may be needed to demonstrate PE. One is active pharmaceutical ingredients or API sameness, which is discussed in the previous presentation. And two, which is the core of this presentation, is the additional in vitro PE studies. Examples are the dissolution, enzyme activity, and viscosity. A common example of in vitro assessment I will stop at is the solution. And I want to stress here that the BE dissolution, or can be called in vitro release testing, is an additional dissolution testing that can be different from the quality control dissolution seen in the truck product release specification and stability. The aim of the PE dissolution for binders is to measure the rate and the extent of the active binding moiety or related moiety released from the dosage form using biorelevant condition. An example of an active binding moiety is uh, lanthanum in the case of lanthanum carbonate and aluminum is an example of binding related moiety for sucrophate. The rationale of recommending BE dissolution for locally acting GI drugs to support in vitro binding study or even to be in lieu of binding studies depends on the drug product. In the example of a ferric citrate tablet, which is a phosphate binder, the PSG recommends demonstrating API sameness between the test and reference products and gives two options. One option is phosphate binding studies, and the second option is the solution if the test product is qualitatively, or Q1, and quantitatively, or Q2, same as the reference product. So in this case, the solution for the Q1, Q2 product is to show if the formulation and the manufacturing process have an impact on the release of the drug. In the example of lanthanum carbonate chewable tablet, the dissolution here determines the release of the active binding moiety lanthanum in the two extreme conditions representative of chewing, which are using the whole and the crushed tablet. So in this case, the dissolution provides supportive evidence for the binding study done on the fully disintegrated tablets. The last example I will talk about is sucrophate products, uh, which are the tablet and the suspension. The dissolution or release of aluminium in acidic media indicates the activation of the, of the drug and it's related to its effectiveness, where the binding is not the only mechanism of action uh, for the drug. Before talking about the sucrophate case, there are a few points I want to stress on regarding the dissolution method and the selected condition. While the details of dissolution conditions are listed for some PLGs, they are not in others. And thus, when developing the dissolution method, keep in mind when selecting the conditions that the condition should be bio-relevant condition, such as choosing appropriate pH that reflect the pH ranges where the drug dissolution occurs in the GI tract. In addition, the condition should be flab appropriate as choosing type of buffers that should not confound analysis of the analyte. Obviously, you cannot use phosphate buffer to dissolve phosphate binders. 
Lastly, for Q1 and Q2 formulation, the solution should be able to discriminate the effect of formulation and manufacturing process variability. Before continuing, let's test your understanding of what I presented so far. Which of the following is true for in vitro assessment for BE determination of locally acting GI drugs binders? A. In vitro binding is the only in vitro BE assessments for binders. B. They are part of drug product quality control specification. C. They are neither based on drugs mechanism of action nor product specific. D. They may include the solution or release of active binding moiety. And the true statement is D. They may include the solution or release of active binding moiety, which is one of the most recommended in vitro assessments in PLGs. Moving to the in vitro assessment of sucrophate products as a key case. Sucrophate, as can be seen from the chemical structure on the right, is an insoluble aluminum salt of sacrose octosulfate. It is minimally absorbed from the GI tract, and it is indicated for the treatment of active duodenal ulcer. Sucrophate is available as a tablet and suspension with administration dose of one gram four times a day up to eight weeks. And it should be administrative on an empty stomach and that's critical for its mechanism. On this slide, you can find the approved brand and generics of sucrophate tablet and suspension and the PSG of both products are linked on the last column. The previous recommendations of the PSGs of sucrophate included three arm double blind placebo controlled in vivo BE study with clinical endpoints using patients with active duodenal ulcer disease verified by endoscopy and are H. H. pylori negative. The BE study with comparative clinical point is difficult to conduct and was associated with challenges. That resulted in the need for the development of an alternative in vitro method for BE evaluation of sucrophate products. Before looking into the in vitro assessment of sucrophate products recommended in the current PSG and to understand the rationale behind the in those in vitro assessments, we need first to understand the mechanism of action of sucrophate. Even though the mechanism of, uh, of sucrophate is not fully understood, I want to briefly highlight what we know. We said that sucrophate should be taken in an empty stomach. So once it reaches the stomach, which is an acidic environment, the pH of the empty stomach is about 1.2, the aluminum ions start to release from sucrophate, forming polyana aluminum. And with the release of the aluminum, the sulfate groups are exposed on the sucrophate, and now we have a negatively charged moieties. With the presence of the aluminum, those moieties start to aggregate. And the activated charge moieties can now bind specifically to protein at the ulcer area, forming a barrier against acid or hydrogen ions. Also, the moieties can bind to bile salt and bind and deactivate pepsin, which helps in the ulcer treatment. There are other anti-inflammatory effects of sucrophate, as well as sucrophate has some uh, acid neutralizing capacity. Based on the mechanism of action of sucrophate, the BE recommendation include bioassays, 
that are related to binding, such as protein binding, bile acid binding, and pepsin activity. What helped in the development of the revised PSG is the research authored by FDA lab. Some of it can be shown on the right, and those studies looked into the impact of factors such as pH, agitation, amount uh, on the binding of sucralfate to protein or um, serum albumin. Other in vitro uh, assessments were also included in the PSG, such as uh, acid neutralizing capacity. This in vitro assessment that was based on the internal studies uh, include aluminum release in acidic media, which uh, was uh, conducted on reference products for both the tablets and suspension and showed that the aluminum release reached equilibria in about an hour. Knowing that the activation of sucralfate in acidic uh, medium is, uh, is related to its effectiveness and is associated with aggregation, we search other product properties that would change with the addition of acid. And interestingly, we found that the apparent viscosity of sucralfate suspension at the sedimentation rate do increase with the addition of acid. And here, I'm stopping for another challenge question. Which of the following is not included for PE determination of sucralfate products? A, in vitro protein binding study. B, pharmacokinetic study. C, pepsin activity. D, aluminum release or dissolution. And the correct answer is, B, pharmacokinetic study, because the sucralfate is minimally absorbed into the systemic circulation, it is hard to conduct pharmacokinetic study and have a meaningful PE determination. To summarize what I presented in a few points, first, in vitro BE binding is a practical BE approach to assess the performance of locally acting GI drugs at the site of action. However, due to the complexity of locally acting GI drugs, other in vitro assessments may be needed to demonstrate BE. Dissolution is a commonly recommended in vitro assessment that can measure the rate and extent of the active binding moiety or related moieties at the site of action. And finally, demonstrating PE for sucralfate products, which is a locally acting GI drug, can be done using several in vitro assessments. Thank you for listening. If you have any question, I would be glad to answer them during the panel discussion. As a closing thought, I want to say that the more effort to understand complex drugs, such as locally acting GI drugs, the closer industry gets to develop more generics of complex drugs. Thank you again, and see you in the panel discussion. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here to talk about common deficiencies in the case studies of in vitro binding bioequivalent studies, and I will be using sucralfate suspension and tablets as examples. As this talk is part of the workshop, we do have some learning objectives here. After my talk, I hope you'll be able to first outline common deficiencies identified in in vitro binding BE studies. Of course, if every sponsor will be paying attention to avoid these kind of deficiencies in the future, these deficiencies identified here will no longer be common anymore. Second, after the talk, 
You should be able to describe ways to reduce review cycles for your end submissions containing in vitro binding studies. And third, you will learn to describe the alternative approaches and the comprehensive scientific justifications for BE establishment. My talk will start with introduction of products with in vitro binding studies recommended in the PSG, including the sucrophase suspension and tablets, followed by common deficiencies and case studies, and then end with a summary. There were multiple drug products with in vitro binding study recommended. You have heard my colleagues talking about it earlier, and I will not go over them in details here. However, I will use sucrophate as an example in today's talk, but bear in mind that many of the concepts I talked here may be applied to other products with similar in vitro binding option recommended. This is a slide about the mechanism of action for sucrophate. As my colleagues had already talked about it earlier, I will not go over the details here either. But would like to remind you that the mechanism of action is a key reason that the agency recommends a series of in vitro studies for B establishment for sucrophate products. Based on the understanding of how sucrophate works, the PSG recommends several bioassays in addition to formulations and the physical chemical property requirements. Notice sucrophate suspension and the tablets were approved under two different NDAs, but these two NDAs belong to the same holder. The two dosage form products show the majority of in vitro option recommendations. Comparable disintegration time is a specific recommendation to the tablet dosage form. Now let's take a look at where the visual binding study deficiencies come from. I break these deficiencies into, two th into three major parts. The first is method development and optimization part. The second is bioanalytical part, which includes pre-study and in-study analysis. And the third is pivotal study part, Pivotal study may have inherited deficiencies from method development and bioanalytical in addition to its own issues like a study results analysis. Method development and optimization is the basis for setting up your pivotal study, and that is why it is so critical. And so far, I'll say this is the part that has the most common deficiencies being identified. The deficiencies include either completely missing method development and optimization in one or more of the parameters, such as incubation media, pH, volume, etc. Additionally, insufficient method development and optimization were also identified. For example, for the parameters selected, there was no rationale explained no supporting data or experimental details submitted. Another unacceptable case is that the adsorbent concentration and the range relative to adsorbent concentration are not optimal, which means that the binding curve um, may not show a clear rising portion or a, a plateau region. So let me ask you, is this figure an acceptable profile? The answer is no. It has no plateau region. What about this second one? It's a no either, because there's no rising portion. How about the third one? Yes, it's an acceptable one with a clear rising portion and a maximum binding region of the plateau region. The common deficiencies for bioanalytical part come from incomplete analytical method validation or data submission, such as incomplete stability data, incomplete dilution integrity data. For biosolid data, 
Remember to submit both individual and the total data if mixture biosalts were used in the study. Also, some submissions did not provide 100% analytical raw data or 20% chromatogram data for pivotal study. Actually, if you just treat this part as a regular in vivo PK bioanalytical study, you probably want to leave out the, these raw data submission. In a pivotal study, many study design deficiencies are inherited from inadequate method development, such as the inadequate adsorbate concentration and range determination, which leads to inadequate binding profile either without the plateau or without the rising portion. So once again, I would like to emphasize the importance of the method development and optimization. For the data analysis, notice that correct units should be used in the data file and the analysis consistently. The Langmuir constants K1 and the K2 should be calculated from the 12 individual replicates, but not the mean of 12 replicates. And be careful that 90% confidence interval acceptance range of K2 is 80 to 120% because the untransformed data were used here for analysis. Next, I will talk about three case studies. The first one is related to formulation. Another one is related to serum and albumin binding. And the third one is related to biosalt binding. Case study number one is a sucrophate suspension submission. The agency recommends Q1, Q2 the same for the in vitro option, but the proposed test formulation is deviated from the recommendations in PSG. It is Q1 the same, but not Q2 the same as the RD. So you may wonder, oh my, will this work? Keep in mind that there is no regulatory requirement on Q2 for oral suspension and the PSG is a non-binding recommendation. So theoretically, this could potentially work out, but comprehensive scientific justification for BE establishment is required. In this case, additional bioassays were conducted to demonstrate that Q2 difference does not incur negative impact on BE assessment. Mucoadhesion assay was conducted to demonstrate the comparable total sucrophate adhered to stomach. Delay in acid diffusion assay was conducted to demonstrate the comparable function as barrier to the diffusion of hydrogen ions. And the delay in biosalt diffusion assay was conducted to demonstrate the comparable function as barrier to the diffusion of biosalts. The second case study is about the study design on HSA binding. In our current PSG for sucrophate, the human serum albumin or bovine serum albumin binding design is recommended to be a fixed amount of sucrophate versus a range of albumin. And the uh, Langmuir constants K1 and K2 will be calculated based on the study results. However, in this case, the applicant's study design is a fixed amount of HSA and the range of sucrophate concentrations. The Hill equation was used to calculate KD values for B evaluation. So similar to the last case study, an alternative approach is potentially acceptable, provided that comprehensive scientific justification was provided, and it satisfied the requirements of the applicable statutes and regulations. In this case, we would like to know the rationale behind the selection of this method. How sensitive is this method when compared with the recommended one? And specifically to this Hill equation model, we are asking, is KD alone sufficient for BE determination? How about the Hill factors impact on BE determination? 
Again, the message um, I would like to deliver here is alternative approaches should be scientifically justified with comprehensive supporting data and explanation. Now, um, let's look at the last case study. It is about biosalt binding and more specifically, the selection of biosalts. In this case, the applicant selected TDC as the biosalt for binding study and the decision was made based on literature information alone. Now think about the common deficiencies I've talked about earlier. Can you identify the potential issues here? Yes, there's no experimental data support as there were no development and optimization studies conducted here. The justification by citing literature alone is insufficient. Keep in mind that Literature conclusions sometimes could be difficult to reproduce due to reasons like different study conditions, different grades of chemicals used in the study, and so on. So what should you do here? Right, uh, conducting the method development and optimization study by yourself. You can compare sucrophate binding with different biosalts and analyze the binding profiles and capacities to select the optimal sort or sorts for your own binding study. Okay, now I have described about the common deficiencies identified in in vitro binding B studies, and I've also showed you case studies related to alternative approach or common deficiency. You should be able to find ways to reduce the review cycles for your and the submission containing in vitro binding studies. That is, uh, first, to avoid common deficiencies. Method development and optimizations are critical. Make sure you have done your best on this part first. And deficiencies on missing documents or study data should be minimized. Those are easy points to score. Secondly, if you select an alternative VE approach, be sure to provide comprehensive scientific data and explanations to justify your approach. And lastly, it is recommended that you communicate with the agency as soon as possible regarding your proposed alternative approaches to facilitate your generic product development. Controlled correspondences and the pre-end meetings are good communication channels to discuss with the agency. Before ending my talk, I do have a couple of challenge questions for you. The first challenge question is, which of the following is true? A, 90% confidence interval acceptance range on K2 is 80 to 125%. B, an acceptable equilibrium binding profile should clearly demonstrate both a rising portion and a maximum binding region. Take a second to consider which is the correct answer. And yes, the correct answer is B. I have mentioned it earlier, both the rising portion and the plateau region should be clearly demonstrated. A is not true because the correct range is 80 to 120% as the analysis should be based on uh, non-transformed data. Okay, second question is, which of the following statements is not true? A, alternative B approaches are only recommended in these locally acting GI drug products. B, both controlled correspondence and the pre and the product development meeting provide communication channels to discuss with the agency for alternative B approaches. And C, the draft guidance when finalized will represent the current thinking of the FDA on this topic. D, physiologically relevant conditions should be taken into consideration in designing and conducting the in vitro binding studies. The correct answer is A, which means statement A is not true. You can use an alternative approach if it satisfies the requirements of the applicable statutes and regulations and you are able to provide 
comprehensive scientific justification. The alternative approach is not limited to the locally acting jet drug products. And this concludes my presentation. I would like to thank my colleagues in the Office of Bioequivalence for their support and help in the site preparation and in the bioequivalence assessments of these submitted NDAs. Without their hard work, I would not be able to be here to deliver this talk. I would also like to thank SBIA Organizing Committee to provide me this opportunity. Thank you all, and I will be back in a few minutes to answer questions on the panel. Thanks again. Thank you all for the wonderful presentations. We're heading into our first Q&A panel for today. And if you haven't had a chance to enter your questions relevant to the presentations into the Q&A chat pod, please do so now. We'll answer as many questions as time allows. We welcome to the Q&A panel Dr. Hong Ling Zhang, who's the Director of the Division of Bioequivalence II in the Office of Bioequivalence and OGD. Since joining OGD in 2008, she's been involved in evaluating bioequivalent submissions and ANDAs for many complex drug products and BE studies with complex scientific and or regulatory issues. Looks like we have a few questions coming in right now, and the first couple of questions are addressed to Dr. Weijie Sun, and here is the first question for Dr. Sun. At what pH should bile acid binding and albumin binding to sulcrophate be studied? So this is a quick question. So for the medium pH or for the uh, binding conditions, it could optimize the study design by conducting some studies and the developing methods to understand which condition is most sensitive to the binding and the condition is bio-relevant. And then select the conditions with the justification. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. We do have another question for Dr. Sun. And here is the question. If all active substances are binded and excreted, how is this local action made by the drug? So, uh, thank you for the questions. So, the drug substance will bind the absorbate in the GI tract. So, for example, for example, bind the potassium from the dietary in the GI tract. So, the absorbate will not be absorbed into the systemic circulation, and it can reduce the absorbate in the plasma through this mechanism. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. Moving on to our next panelist. We have a couple of questions for Dr. Hong Mei Li. And here is the, der the first question for Dr. Li. Could you clarify on slide 13 the difference between step two and step three? Thanks for the question. Um, the slide 13 is about conducting API semi study. Uh, first, I need to clarify it's not sl step two and three. There are at least four general methods to conduct API semi, mostly focus on the sample preparation for the study. For the second method, test API was extract the RD API, means you compare the pure. API use your in, use the in your test product compared with extract API from RD product. Um, second, the third is extract API from test product was extract API from RD. That means um, you using same extraction method. Uh, you can you compare the uh, the extract API of the test product with extract API from RD in that way you can minimize the interfere from the extraction method because you're using the same extraction method. So the difference for two and three mainly is for the test API. Second, 
the, the two is use a pure API, and the three is uh, using same extraction method test the extract API of the test product. I hope I can I clearly I clarify this question. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lee, for responding to that question. We do have another question for you, and here is the question. Is it expected that all seamless details be included in the Q1, Q2 submission during a controlled correspondence? Thanks for the question. The straight answer is you, know, you don't need to include in the seamless study uh, the details in the correspondence regarding Q1, Q2 uh, submission. Q1, Q2 is for the excipients for the drug product formulation. The default is, uh, is not about the API. So the answer is no, you don't need to. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. Moving on to our next panelist. We have a couple of questions that came in for Dr. Manar Algavish. And here is the first, and first question for Dr. Algavish. Would a finished product site transfer for products such as sulcrophate suspension or sulcrophate suspension um, require repetition of in vitro binding studies or only in vitro test and physical chemical characterization tests such as a dissolution, would that be sufficient? <clears throat> Great question. Um, I've seen similar question as well about um, the site transfer. And I want to uh, want to stress again that um, while we've been focusing on this presentation on the bioequivalence, site transfer may also include or stress on the quality of the product. So um, you need to make sure, you know, when you do the site transfer, is that the quality of the product is maintained the same. And that, you know, could be done by not only one uh, study, but could be done on several um, requirements, several studies. Thank you for responding to that question. We do have another question for Dr. Agabish, and here is the question. For products such as cation exchange resins like sodium polystyrene powder for suspension, there are no functional binding or locally acting moieties for which a dissolution testing can be performed. Would it be acceptable not to have dissolution testing in such cases if the finished product specification contains tests such as assays for the ion exchange moieties like the assay for sodium ions. Oh, that's a very detailed question. Um, as I said previously, the solution is one of the common um, in vitro assessments in the PSG, but again, I also specified that for the solution, it's a case by case. So if the solution is recommended for one product, it's not necessarily recommended for all the locally acting. And, you know, so I cannot really in detail specifically cite, talk about this product, but I would recommend you uh, check the PSG for the recommendations. Thank you for responding to that question. Moving on to our next panelist. We have a few questions that came in for Dr. Hongfei Zhao, and here is the first question for Dr. Zhao. Is it necessary to use a full dose of sulcrophate suspension, i.e. like 10 mils, for conducting in vitro an in vitro bioequivalent study? Thank you for the question. Um, this question, uh, the, the short answer is, you have to uh, conduct the method development and optimization first to determine the optimal um, adsorbent and adsorbate relative ratio to determine the, um, the range and the, the optimal sucrophase suspension amount. So, if your method is sensitive enough to detect the uh, BSA and uh, 
so so you you may just use a less amount but if in the in the deduction that uh, uh, you have um, if you have problem then you probably need to add a, a bit more of the super free suspension and the BSA uh, re reaching the optimal um, detection range for your uh, optimized method. So come back to the, uh, as I emphasized earlier, so you, you have to do the optimization and development first. Thanks. Thank you for responding to that question. We do have a, another question for Dr. Zhao, and here is the question. How many minimum number of lots of RLD must be used to establish sameness of the API, considering the variability of the drug and analytical methods? Dr. Zhao, this is the moderator. We're not able to hear you at this time. What we're going to do is move on to another panelist and then check back in with you after the tech teams had an opportunity to reach out to you to assist with your volume. So we're going to move back up to uh, the beginning of our panel, Dr. Weijie Sun. And here is the first question for Dr. Sun. Does any locally acting GI drug <clears throat> Is it recommended for pharmacokinetic drug uh, studies? So thank you for the questions. Uh, yes. So some locally acting dry drug recommends the PK studies. The for example, the mesalamine or the butanosinide drug products. So in addition to the fasting and fat studies, uh, for these drug products, the comparative dissolution testing at different pH may be recommended to compare the test and the reference product. And this is to demonstrate that the test product and the reference product are targeting the same region of the GI tract and de determine whether the same amount of the drug is released from the test and reference product. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. We do have another question that came in from Dr. Sun, and here is the question. Are the media pH of in vitro kinetic binding study the same as the in vitro equilibrium binding study? Uh, thank you for the questions. So uh, it depends on the drug products. For most of the products, the median pH are the same for in vitro connected and the equilibrium by the studies. But for some of the products, uh, it may be different. So it could refer the product specific guidance to have more detail or specific recommendation. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. Moving on to our next panelist. We have a couple more questions that came in from Dr. Hong Mei Li. <clears throat> Here's the first question. If the PSD doesn't recommend for demonstrating API sameness, does it mean that there's no need to demonstrate API sameness? Mm, API sameness is always required for generic drug product because it's a part of the uh, pharmaceutical equivalence demonstration. So uh, even if it's not documenting PSG, is has to be demonstrated. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question, Dr. Lee. We have another question that came in for you. Here's the question. 
When the PSG recommends characterization tests for dimming API sameness, API sameness study, does it mean that no other additional testing is required? The PSG for complex product with complex API always recommend, most time recommend API sameness demonstration, but if not recommend for API sameness, You, um, it still need to demonstrate API sameness. It just didn't um, put in the PSG to reflect the FDA thinking, but it's still recommended to do the API sameness. If you have a question regarding how to demonstrate API sameness, particularly for complex API, for generic drug product, you can communicate with FDA regarding your proposal and the thinking. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. Moving on to our next panelist, we have a couple more questions that came in for Dr. Manar al -Gabish. And here's the first question for Dr. al -Gabish. Can you comment on the source of BSA-4 slide number 16? Is it human BSA or can other animal sources be used? Thank you for your question. Um, so, if you're specifically asking about the studies is done in FDA, or I presented in slide 16, uh, it's actually, it's, it's a bovine, so the sources, you know, from you know, bovine or cows. Um, is it need to be human or other sources? Um, human, you know, could be more bi bio-relevant, but also bovine could be one of the good sources for the BS, uh, for the serum albumin, and that's because um, bovine is, you know, is a standard um, albumin uh, used for several protein binding studies, um, and it's already well characterized and known to be also uh, stable. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. We do have another question that just came in for Dr. al -Gabish. And here is the question. What are examples of bio-relevant conditions for BE dissolution? Um, example of that, I would always say it's good to always refer to the PSG and the RLD labeling for that. Um, one example for that, uh, you know, could be um, the aluminum uh, release for sucralfate. It's recommended to be done on 1.2 or the acidic conditions in the gastric. Um, other relevant conditions, for example, for drugs that is given uh, with food is to go for like food state conditions that could be, you know, about pH 3 or higher. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. I'm going to check back in with Dr. Hong Fei Zhao, and here's the following question for Dr. Zhao. For method validation of an in vitro binding study, is an accuracy study required for method validation, and what may be the acceptance criteria for an in vitro binding study? Thank you. Thank you for the question. So, uh, for the method validation of in vitro binding study, the accuracy study is also required for this method validation. So basically, you can just think about it, uh, treat it as a uh, PK in vivo study method validation. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. We do have another somewhat extended question for you, uh, Dr. Zhao, and here is the question. For sulcrophate oral suspension, because there are excipient solids in the Q1-Q2 test and RLD formulations, do you think it's necessary or meaningful to extract API from both test and RLD to undergo the PSG characterization characteristics such as UV, X-ray, et cetera, 
and acid neutralization, knowing that the minor components of the solid excipient after extraction should not alter or add value for the sameness analytical methodologies. Thank you for the question. I can answer this question instead. Um, the question regarding the method used for, for extracting API for the API safety study. Uh, again, the question is, do you think it is necessary or meaningful to extract API from both test and RD to undergo the PSG characterizations, knowing that the minor component of the solid sapiens after extraction should not alter at a value for the same analytical, uh, analytical methodologies. So if you knowing that minor components for this, uh, for, for the, this method will add value, you could pursue others. The slide 13 lists the four approaches you can use in uh, combined uh, one, either uh, some of them to do the API safety study. Again, it's totality of the evidence approach. If you think you have justification for that, you can do this. So we are using the uh, totality of evidence approach for, for the API similar demonstration. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lee, for uh, stepping in on that question. We're going to swing back over to Dr. Hongfei Zhao. And there is another question for Dr. Zhao. And here's the question. You've explained the alternative approach in BE establishment. I'm wondering if there are any successful cases. Very good question. Um, yes, the short answer is yes. Um, alternative approach is uh, real. As I mentioned earlier, the key to the success is comprehensive uh, scientific justification and the alternative approach should satisfy the requirements of the ap applicable statutes and regulations. Uh, again, if, if it decided that alternative approach may be more appropriate for you, then please reach out to the agency for further assistance. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. We do have a question that came in for Dr. Hongling Zhang. And here is the question for Dr. Zhang. In addition to incubation time and adsorbate concentration, is there any factor that should be considered for binding studies? Thank you for the question. Uh, in addition to the incubation time and the sorbate concentration, uh, depending on the characteristic of the drug product, for example, the site of action, mechanism of drug action, etc., uh, the conditions of the binding study will be different, uh, such as with or without acid pretreatment, the pH of the binding medium. So in general, when design a binding study, other factors need to be considered also include the amount of the drug product, the volume of the binding medium, and also some binding study also shows pH dependent phenomena. So it is desirable that the binding study can provide optimum conditions for differentiation, the binding potential of the different drug products. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. Moving back to the beginning of our panel, we do have another question that came in for Dr. Wei J. Sun. And here is the question. How many lots are needed for an in vitro binding study? Uh, thank you for the questions. So if there is no further recommendations in the product specific guidance, uh, usually one lot for the in vitro binding study is fine. Thank you. 
Thank you for responding to that question. Moving on to our next panelist, we did have a more we have a couple more questions that came in for Dr. Hong Mei Li, and here's the question for Dr. Li. Some of the PSGs for complex drug products with a complex API don't include recommended characterization tests for demonstrating API sameness. What does the applicant do? Thank you. That's a good question. Um, with the efforts from FDA, the PSG uh, was revised and updated with recommendation tests. So uh, previously, some of the PSG may, may not have the, the test. Uh, uh, so the forum could uh, communicate with FDA for your proposal or for your preliminary study data regarding the downstream API semi if the PSC didn't have the test. So again, I want to still very encouraging and advocate the firm to communicate with FDA uh, uh, on time and efficiently for, for your and, uh, submission and development. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. We do have another question for Dr. Lee. And here's the question. If the applicant attempts to propose different characterization tests or analytical techniques for API sameness, for an API sameness study for the generic products, what should the applicant do? It's a good question again. Uh, again, we encouraging the, uh, uh, the firm to communicate with FDA through their variable channels, such as the pre and the development meeting or pre and submission meeting for your proposal for your you know, primary study data for the API semi study. So just reach out to FDA, communicate what was your proposal, and before uh, pre and meeting or uh, pre and meetings, there's various channels. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. We just had a question, one more question come in for Dr. Lee, and here is the question. Why does the word sameness have quotation marks in the title? First, uh, this title successfully get your attention and your question. Um, the quotation on sameness is mainly for the complex API sameness. Uh, we have examples for the local acting drug, uh, which com contains complex API, such as ferric citrate and uh, silver hydrochloride, which is polymers. There are complex APIs, so it's very challenging. We recognize it's challenging to do exactly sameness of the API compared with uh, RD API. So instead, uh, we put a uh, quotation mark. That means uh, we, it, we need to demonstrate the equivalence of the RD API through a totality evidence approach. Again, the take home message is that I hope with this quotation to get your attention that um, the totality of evidence approach is a general principle and the FDA consideration for uh, assessing a generic product with complex APIs. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. Now we're moving on to our next panelist. We have a question that came in for Dr. Manar Algabish. And here is the question. Either the sulcrophate should be suspended or it should be it should form the gel mass um, after the addition of acid. So we're trying to figure that out. Thank you for your question. Even though it's not clear for me, uh, it's a question about the API sucrophate or the drug product. Um, but assuming the talk is about the sucrophate suspension. So the sucrophate suspension, you know, it should be um, as quality, it should be suspended. And in a, any slight change of the pH, it should stay in suspension. And this is one, you know, one of the, you know, product specification for that. Uh, however, with the addition of acid, and we talked about the API itself, it's known to aggregate, and that could produce a change in viscosity. Um, to form a paste or a gel mass, 
uh, it's not uh, necessary, but it, it, you know, with a, a very, with, a, with addition of very strong acid, it is shown to have a change in viscosity or some formation of an aggregation. Thank you. Hopefully that answers. Thank you for responding to that question. We just had another question that came in from Dr. Algabish. And here is the question. Why is serum albumin used for the protein binding studies for sucrophate? To answer that is actually for, for two reasons. One, as I said previously, serum albumin is one of the standard protein, uh, one of the standard proteins is used for any protein studies, and this is why it was picked for uh, sucrophage. And two, uh, some of the studies show that a specific, you know, the regions of ulcer uh, has high, um, excretion of, uh, of proteins, including serum albumin. So uh, that will be an indication of the specific binding of the sucrophate to the ulcer region. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. We just have a couple more minutes left and we're trying to get in one more question. And the next question just came in for Dr. Hong Fei Zhao, and here is the question. You didn't talk much about the in vitro pepsin activity study for sulfate products, which is also recommended as one of the bioassays. Can you talk a bit more about this? Sure, um, I'm glad to. So pepsin activity study is an assay for sulfate products but it's not generally recommended for other locally acting GI products. So I didn't talk much about it. Um, it is an activity assay rather than a binding assay, but binding to the enzyme does not necessarily mean the inhibition of enzyme activity. So just be careful on that difference here. And, and different from the BSA, HSA, or biosource binding studies, the equivalence here is based on the qualitative comparison between the test and the RD formulation with respect to the percentage decrease in pepsin activity. And as I emphasized earlier, method development and optimization are also critical here for the pepsin activity assay. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. Well, that's all the time we have for questions during this first Q&A panel. I want to give a huge thank you to our panelists for answering numerous questions that came in. We'll now transition into our break and return at 10.15 a.m. Eastern Time. Enjoy your break.